History Origins Amidst the 19th century, the Qing dynasty grappled with an array of tribulations, encompassing famines, natural calamities, economic woes, and defeats at the hands of foreign powers. Peasants bore the brunt of burdensome levies, surging rents, and a mass exodus from their homesteads. The Qing military encountered a formidable setback in the First Opium War, and the Chinese economy suffered the repercussions of the clandestine influx of opium, engendering a trade disequilibrium. This epoch witnessed the ascent of brigandage, clandestine fraternities, and self-defense militias, ushering in an escalation of skirmishes on a smaller scale. Concurrently, China's populace burgeoned, almost doubling between 1766 and 1833, while arable land stagnated. The governance, primarily steered by ethnic Manchus, veered into escalating corruption, notably in the southern regions where local clans held sway. The Hakka community, a subgroup of the Han Chinese, harbored particularly pronounced anti-Manchu sentiments. Missionaries of the Christian faith also wielded influence during this era. In 1837, Honghua Xiao, a hacker hailing from a destitute village in Guangdong, grappled with a nervous collapse after failing the imperial examination for the third instance. In the course of convalescence, he dreamt of venturing into the celestial realm, encountering a divine family distinct from his terrestrial kin. By 1843, following his fourth and conclusive examination failure, propelled by a visit from his cousin, Hong meticulously scrutinized Christian pamphlets procured from a Protestant missionary years prior. Convinced that these writings held the cipher to deciphering his visions, Hong embraced the conviction that his ethereal progenitor was none other than God the Father, his elder sibling embodied Jesus Christ, and his mandate was to purge the world of malevolent entities, encompassing the corrupt Qing administration and Confucian doctrines. In 1847, Hong delved into Bible study in Guangzhou under the tutelage of Isachar Jacobs Roberts, an American Baptist missionary who demurred from baptizing him, citing Hong's adherence amalgamation of religious pretenses with political aspirations. Subsequently, Hong commenced preaching in Guangxi in 1844, culminating in the establishment of the God-worshipping society by his disciple Feng Yunshan. This movement, amalgamating Christianity, Taoism, Confucianism, and autochthonous millenarianism, aspired to reinstate the ancient Chinese reverence for Shangdi. The Taiping faith, colloquially known as Taiping Christianity, materialized as a vibrant novel Chinese religion. Initially directed at quelling marauders and seafaring marauders, the movement metamorphosed into guerrilla warfare and eventually burgeoned into a pervasive civil conflict, as Qing authorities endeavored to suppress it. Two additional figures within the God-worshipping society asserted the capacity to speak as constituents of the celestial family, Yang Xiuqing as the father and Xiao Chaogui as Jesus Christ. Early Years The genesis of the Taiping Rebellion unfolded in the southern enclave of Guangxi, catalyzed by local authorities instigating a religious persecution crusade against the God-worshipping society. In the initial throes of January 1851, subsequent to a minor skirmish in late December 1850, a rebellious contingent numbering 10,000, under the command of Feng Yunshan and Wei Changhui, vanquished Qing forces stationed in Jintian, modern-day Guiping, Guangxi. The Taiping forces adept repelled an ensuing imperial counteroffensive by the Green Standard Army, retaliating to the Jintian insurrection. On the 11th of January 1851, Hong proclaimed himself the Heavenly King of the Heavenly Kingdom of Peace, or Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, bestowing the nomenclature Taipings, now ubiquitously employed in English scholarly discourse. In September 1851, the Taipings traversed northwards to elude encroaching Qing forces. Tracing the course of the Strong River, the Taiping military progressed into Hun, besieging Changsha, seizing Yuju, and annexing Wuchang in December 1852 upon reaching the Yangtze River. At this critical juncture, the Taiping leadership opted for an eastward trajectory along the Yangtze River, capturing Anqing in February 1853. There are intimations that Taiping leaders may have sought alliances with triad organizations, entrenched in South China and among government militias. The nomenclature employed by the Taiping's mirrored triad terminology, whether consciously or inadvertently, rendering the movement more enticing for triads to align themselves with. 
In 1852, Qing government forces apprehended Hong De Kuan, a insurgent who had assumed the designation Qian De Wang, King of Heavenly Virtue. Hong De Kuan's admission posited that Hong Xiu Chuan had designated him co-sovereign of the Heavenly Kingdom, and conferred upon him that appellation. Nevertheless, this narrative likely resonated with an antecedent but unrelated White Lotus Rebellion. The seizure of Nanjing in the same annum precipitated a deterioration in relations between the Taiping insurgents and the Triads. Middle Years On the 19th of March, 1853, the Taipings laid claim to Nanjing, with Hong designating it as the celestial capital of his realm. Branding the Manchus as malevolent entities, the Taipings executed all Manchu men, expelled Manchu women beyond the city confines, and subjected them to an infernal demise. Subsequent to this gruesome episode, the Taipings instigated northern and western campaigns to alleviate the strain on Nanjing and procure territorial expansions. The northern endeavor met with failure, while the western expedition achieved modest success. In the annal of 1853, Hong Xiuquan receded from hands-on governance, steering the reins through written edicts. Enmeshed in opulent living with a plethora of consorts, he clashed with Yang Xiuqing, culminating in the 1856 Tianjin incident where Yang and his adherents met their demise at Hong's behest. Shadakai's descent led to the demise of his kin, Wei Changhui's bid to incarcerate Hong proved futile, and Wei along with Qin Rigang faced execution. Shadakai assumed command of five Taiping contingents, but, apprehensive for his life, decamped from Tianjin to Sichuan. With Hong in seclusion and Yang vanquished, the Taiping leadership endeavored to broaden support and cement alliances with European powers, albeit unsuccessfully. Europeans maintained an official stance of neutrality, notwithstanding their military advisors' service alongside the Qing forces. Domestically, resistance emanated from conservative rural factions and the affluent landowning elite, perturbed by Taiping doctrines and stringent gender demarcation. The Slong army, under the leadership of Zheng Guofan in Hume, emerged as the principal Qing force against the Taiping insurgents. Effective in the Western theater, it reclaimed substantial portions of Hubei and Jiangxi by December 1856. In 1859, Hong Rengan aligned with the Taipings, formulating strategies to expand the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. In May 1860, the Taipings triumphed over besieging imperial forces, facilitating a triumphant incursion into southern Jiangsu and Xijiang provinces. They seized Hangzhou, Changzhou, and Suzhou in 1860. While the Taipings were preoccupied in Jiangsu, Zheng's forces descended the course of the Yangtze River. Fall of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom In June of 1861, the Taipings endeavored to see Shanghai faced resistance, enduring for 15 months before being repelled by a Qing army reinforced with European officers, notably under the command of Frederick Townsend Ward. This formidable contingent, later christened the Ever Victorious Army, and led by Charles George Gordon, played a pivotal role in quelling the Taiping insurgency. In 1861, coinciding with the demise of the Xianfeng Emperor and the ascent of the Tongji Emperor, Zheng Guofan's strong army, with Royal Navy support through a maritime blockade, successfully laid claim to Anqing. Toward the conclusion of 1861, the Taipings embarked on a conclusive eastern expedition, capturing Ningbo on December 9 and besieging, then capturing Hangzhou on December 31, 1861. Despite encircling Shanghai in January 1862, the Taipings fell short of capturing the city. The ever-victorious army thwarted another assault on Shanghai in 1862, safeguarding treaty ports such as Ningbo, recaptured on May 10. They collaborated with imperial forces in recapturing Taiping strongholds along the Yangtze River. In 1863, Shidakai surrendered to the Qing in the vicinity of Chengdu and met his demise. Some of his adherents persisted in the struggle. Qing forces, led by Zheng Guofan, Zhuo Zongtang, and Li Hongzhong, regrouped and launched a concerted reconquest. Zheng Guofan embraced the tenets of Ming Dynasty General Qi Jiguang, enlisting support from local villages and circumventing conventional armies. By early 1864, Qing dominion was re-established in the majority of regions. In May 1862, the Xiong army besieged Nanjing, steadfast against Taiping endeavors to dislodge them. Hongxiuquan, 
the Taiping leader, declared that divine intervention would safeguard Nanjing. In June 1864, with Qing forces in proximity, he succumbed to food poisoning. Hong abdicated in favor of his inexperienced son, Hong Qiang Guifu, for months before Nanjing's capitulation in July 1864. Changui's and cohorts were apprehended and met their demise, culminating in the dissolution of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. A diminutive loyalist faction endured in northern Zhejiang, but gradually retreated into the uplands of Jiangxi, Zhejiang, Fujian, and ultimately Guangdong. The last Taiping loyalist, Wang Haiyang, met defeat on January 29, 1866. Policies the Taiping insurgents ushered in a sequence of societal overhauls, encompassing a stringent segregation of genders, the eradication of foot binding, the communalization of land, and the curbing of private commerce. They further prescribed the importation of opium into all Taiping domains. In matters of faith, the kingdom supplanted Confucianism, Buddhism, and indigenous Chinese folk religion with Taiping Christianity, also recognized as God-worshipping. This belief system propounded that Hong Xiuquan was the younger sibling of Jesus and the second progeny of Shangdi. The Taiping militias incinerated Buddhist repositories, deeming them incongruent with their ideology. Confucianism, perceived by Hong as a tool of Qing oppression against the Han populace, underwent considerable desolation, with Confucian monastery archives systematically obliterated, particularly in the Yangtze Delta region. Temples were frequently defaced or repurposed as places of worship for the new faith, alongside serving as hospitals and libraries. Canonical works, including those authored by Confucius, met incineration, with their purveyors facing capital punishment. The Taiping insurgents vehemently opposed idolatry, obliterating idols wherever they surfaced. While the initial eradication of idols garnered approval from foreign missionaries, they subsequently grew apprehensive of the fervor of the Taiping, recognizing the inadvertent repercussions of their influence. In the inaugural years, stringent adherence to gender separation was upheld, though it diminished in subsequent years. The severity of this policy stemmed from a misinterpretation of the Ten Commandments, leading to the Seventh Commandment forbidding not only adultery, but also licentiousness. The extremeness of these measures extended to the point where parents and offspring of opposite genders were barred from interaction and even wedded couples were discouraged from partaking in intimate relations. Military Taiping Forces The Taiping insurgents employed inventive and unconventional tactics that posed a formidable threat to the dynasty, ultimately prompting what one historian hails as the most significant military experimentation since the 17th century. The potency of the Taiping uprising resided in its military, characterized by a heightened level of discipline and zealous fervor. Soldiers typically adorned themselves in red jackets paired with blue trousers, cultivating long tresses, earning them the moniker Long Hair, in China. In the initial phases of the rebellion, the substantial presence of women in the Taiping military set it apart from other 19th century armies, although the number of women dwindled after 1853. Prominent female leaders within the Taiping forces included Hong Xuanjiao, Su Sunyang, and Qiao Ersao. The clashes between the Taiping forces and the imperial troops were consistently brutal, featuring limited artillery but sizable contingents armed with small arms. Engagements were marked by both sides endeavoring to dislodge the other from the battlefield, resulting in substantial casualties without conclusive victories. The primary stratagem of the Taiping military involved the seizure of major cities, consolidating control, and subsequently enlisting local farmers in the adjacent countryside to reinforce their ranks and confront government forces. Estimations posit that the Taiping military comprised around 2 million soldiers, organized into army corps of approximately 13,000 men each, drawing inspiration from the organizational structure of the Qin dynasty. In addition to the principal Taiping forces, several pro-Taiping factions fielded irregular troops. The insurgents were well armed with contemporary weaponry, having procured firearms, artillery, and ammunition from foreign purveyors. While lacking official endorsement from foreign governments, they acquired munitions, including items manufactured in the West, through clandestine channels facilitated by English and American traders. The rebels also ventured into weapon manufacturing and imported equipment, with eyewitness accounts indicating that rebel workshops in Nanjing produce superior firearms, 
including heavy artillery, compared to the Qing arsenal. The Taiping insurgents augmented their modern arsenal with confiscated equipment. Individuals from various nations joined the rebels in combat and administrative capacities, enriching their understanding of Taiping tactics and capabilities. The rebels displayed valor under fire, rapidly erected defensive structures, and utilized mobile pontoon bridges. One effective tactic involved encircling a Qing position with fire and individually targeting fleeing troops. A diminutive Taiping navy, comprising commandeered vessels, navigated the Yangtze and its tributaries. Tanglingtsai, the Han King, distinguished himself as one of the commanders of the Taiping navy. Qing forces. Amidst the resistance against the Taiping rebellion, an imperial force of surpassing magnitude emerged encompassing a multitude exceeding a million disciplined regular troops. This formidable assembly was augmented by an indeterminate array of regional militias and the bolstering presence of foreign mercenaries. Notably, the distinguished ever-victorious army commanded attention, a contingent of Chinese warriors under the leadership of a Western officer cadre, boasting notable figures such as Frederick Townsend Ward and Charles Gordon. This potent force drew sustenance from the arsenals of European arms purveyors like Willoughby and Ponsonby. Within the imperial ranks, the strong army commanded by Zheng Guofan carved a conspicuous niche as a renowned and formidable unit. Another luminary figure among the Qing generals was Zhu Zongtang, hailing from Hune province, whose pivotal role in quelling the tumultuous Taiping rebellion echoed through history. The Yongying armies, steered by local elites in a departure from the central dynasty's control, played an instrumental role in triumph where conventional imperial forces faltered. Despite China's historical acumen in meticulous record-keeping, the decentralized ethos governing the imperial war machinery, relying extensively on regional contingents, coupled with the chaotic theater of civil conflict, thwarted attempts to procure veritable statistics. Furthermore, the annihilation of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom translated into the obliteration of a substantial portion of its archival wealth with an estimated survival rate hovering around a mere 10%. Over the course of the strife, an approximate 90% of those aligning with the Taiping cause met their demise or chose the path of defection. The ferocious and tumultuous character of the rebellion exacted a profound toll on its participants, manifesting in both casualties and the obliteration of historical annals. Total War The Taiping Rebellion unfolded as a total war scenario, characterized by the exhaustive mobilization of nearly every non-evacuated denizen within the confines of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. Citizens underwent military training and were pressed into service, conscripted into the armed forces to counter the encroaching Qing imperial might. A decree under the Taiping household registration system dictated the mandatory enlistment of one adult male from every household into the ranks of the army. In the crucible of this conflict, both factions resorted to strategic measures aimed at depriving the adversary of vital resources crucial for sustaining the protracted war. A grim routine emerged, featuring the deliberate destruction of enemy agricultural zones, the ruthless decimation of urban populations, and the infliction of savage reprisals upon the inhabitants of conquered territories. The objective was to systematically undermine the enemy's capacity to wage war. The totality of the conflict manifested in active civilian participation on both fronts, with the targeting of both civilian populace and military structures. Contemporary narratives depict widespread desolation in rural expanses as an aftermath of the hostilities. In regions annexed by the Taiping, a systematic annihilation of the entire Manchu populace unfolded. In Hune province, a loyalist to the Qing observed genocidal massacres perpetrated by Taiping forces against Manchus, encompassing men, women, and children subjected to execution. Post the capture of Nanjing, approximately 40,000 Manchu civilians met their demise at the hands of the Taiping. On a fateful day, October 27, 1853, a chilling event occurred in Sangzhou as 10,000 Manchus were ruthlessly murdered. Originating in Guangxi, rebels communicating in its dialect faced a stark prohibition from surrender by Qing forces. In Guangdong province, a documented historical record reveals the execution of an estimated one million individuals in successive waves of massacres, following the collapse of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. The onslaught, particularly targeting the hackers, reached a crescendo with a staggering toll of up to 30,000 deaths daily. 
Analogous policies of mass extermination of civilians unfolded in diverse regions of China, including Anhui and Nanjing. These brutal initiatives resulted in widespread civilian displacement and astronomical death toll, the obliteration of around 600 towns, and other catastrophic repercussions. Legacy The cataclysmic upheaval of the Taiping Rebellion left an indelible mark on both the human landscape and the economic fabric, instigating enduring transformations within the late Qing dynasty. A discernible decentralization of power transpired, accompanied by a broader integration of ethnic Han Chinese officials into elevated positions, marking a departure from established norms. The traditional bastion of Manchu banner forces, pivotal to the Qing dynasty's stability, waned, gradually supplanted by locally organized armies orchestrated by the gentry. Scholarly discourse diverges, with some positing that these armies metamorphosed into the regional forces subsequently commandeered by local warlords post the Qing era's demise, while others maintain skepticism, underscoring the distinctive contexts guiding these armies. The revolutionary configuration of the Taiping Rebellion, intertwined with its fusion of Christianity and radical social egalitarianism, cast a long shadow on future revolutionaries, notably influencing figures like Sun Yat-sen. Veterans of the Taiping cause found a new alliance in the revived China society, whose Christian adherents briefly orchestrated the heavenly kingdom of the great Ming Shun in 1903. While Karl Marx perceived the Taipings predominantly as a tumultuous force lacking a defined social program, Chinese communist historians, in line with Mao Zedong's perspective, characterized the rebellion as a precursor to communist uprisings. Both communist and Chinese nationalist military strategists delved into the organizational and strategic nuances of the Taiping Rebellion during the crucible of the Chinese Civil War. General Joseph Stilwell, overseeing Chinese troops in World War II, lauded Zheng Guofan's campaigns for their strategic sagacity. In the aftermath, a pronounced demographic downturn ensued, particularly in the Yangtze Delta region, propelled by famine, diseases, massacres, and societal upheaval. The labor scarcity, a departure from centuries-old norms, accentuated the worth of labor vis-a-vis -vis land. The scorched-earth tactics employed by the Slong army depopulated vast swaths of Anhui, southern Jiangsu, northern Zhejiang, and northern Jiangxi, necessitating repopulation efforts drawing migrants from Henan. The landed gentry in the lower Yangtze region witnessed a reduction in numbers, and the consolidation of land ownership underwent attenuation. The representation of Hunanese in the government witnessed a dramatic surge, following the pivotal role played by Hun military forces in quelling the Taiping Rebellion. By 1865, five out of the eight viceroys hailed from Hun, their experiences in the conflict rendering them more circumspect regarding Western influences compared to their counterparts in other provinces. The prominence of merchants in Shaanxi and the Huizhou region of Anhui dwindled due to the trade disruptions wrought by the rebellion. Nevertheless, coastal trade in Guangzhou and Ningbo experienced comparatively lesser impact, with Shanghai, buoyed by an influx of refugees, emerging as a crucible of economic development. The Qing dynasty's endeavor to rewrite the historical narrative of the conflict precipitated the obliteration of the majority of Taiping published records, leaving only a meager tenth to endure into contemporary times. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and share it. Your support is greatly appreciated, and you can find details on how to support my channels through PayPal and Patreon in the description box below.